Hello and welcome back to Animal Sciences 142. Today's lecture is going to focus on the integumentary system. Now this system focuses on the skin and related structures such as the nails, hair, and hooves. Now as you can see there's a number of learning objectives for today's lecture. Uh, you should be able to tell me about the cells that make up skin and what their different functions are. You should be able to list the three major layers of skin, the epidermis, hypodermis, and also the dermis, and also tell me the five substrata of the epidermis. You should be able to list the unique structures of the hypodermis and also describe the unique features of the paw pads and planum nasale and planum nasolabiale. You should also be able to describe the parts of the hair follicle and describe how hair grows. And you should also be able to describe the three different types of hair. So now that we know a little bit about the functions of skin, we're going to go over the gross anatomy of skin. So skin can be divided into three layers, and these include the epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis. Now I need to point out that your textbook, and indeed most anatomy textbooks, will actually not include the hypodermis as part of the skin. And that's true. The skin is technically only comprised of the epidermis and the dermis. However, there's no other chapter where we get to talk about the hypodermis. And so in my lecture, I will include the hypodermis, uh, otherwise known as the subcutaneous layer, as a third layer of the skin. But just be aware that other professors and other textbooks may split out the hypodermis and include it in another section of the body. Now, depending on the area of the body that you're looking at, the skin may be very thick or it may be quite thin. Thin skin tends to be most numerous on the mammalian body, and it covers all parts of the body except for the paw pads, and it's usually hairy. Uh, it has a sparse distribution of sensory receptors uh, in comparison to thick skin. Now, thick skin, on the other hand, is found on the plantar and palmar surfaces of the digits and the soles of the feet. Uh, it features five epidermal layers, whereas the thin skin only has three. Thick skin lacks hair follicles and also lacks the associated structures such as erect or pili muscles and sebaceous glands. We'll talk more about thick and thin skin as we go through the lecture. So the top layer of the skin is called the epidermis. Remember epi means on top and dermis here meaning skin. So the epidermis is comprised of stratified squamous epithelium. And remember that stratified meant that we had several cell layers. And that a stratified epithelium is going to be really good for protecting us from drying out or protecting our bodies from abrasion. It's not going to be very good for moving things across such as secretion and absorption. Now there's four different types of cells that we're going to talk about in the next slide and potentially four or five different strata or layers to the epidermis. So first we're going to take a look at the cells that comprise the epidermis. The most abundant cell is something called a keratinocyte. And a keratinocyte, as the name implies, contains lots of keratin. And keratin is a very tough, waterproof protein which helps skin to maintain its structure and also prevents the underlying tissues from drying out. 
The second type of cell is something you've probably heard of before called a melanocyte. And melanocytes help to protect the underlying tissues from UV radiation by producing a protective pigment called melanin. The third cell is something called a tactile cell or Merkel cell. And Merkel cells have a sensory receptor function. That is, they're located very close to a sensory neuron and they transduce information on things like pressure and vibration into nerve impulses which are carried away by sensory neurons towards the spinal cord. And finally, the fourth cell we have is something called a dendritic cell or longer Hans cells. These cells are basically sentinels that are part of our immune system and they will grab a hold of potentially pathogenic organisms and they will present these to our white blood cells for recognition and eventual destruction. Because remember that the skin and indeed the epidermis is the first barrier between us and the outside environment. So it makes a lot of sense that we basically want to have some guards uh, out there guarding that barrier and making sure no pathogenic organisms make their way into the deeper areas of the body. Now before we go on to talk about the strata or layers of the epidermis, I want to say a word about skin color and pigmentation. You probably already know that melanin is a very important pigment to helping protect the skin from UV radiation. And melanin is produced in melanocytes, as we'll see here in just a minute. And in fact, melanin is the only pigment that is actually made in the skin. The other two pigments, however, still have a role in determining the color of the skin. And so hemoglobin is the pigment that we find in red blood cells, and it has a red coloration. And so hemoglobin is important for giving certain people uh, the red hue that they have in their face. If you look at people that are Irish or that are European ancestry and they don't have a whole lot of melanin in there, uh, you can often see that sort of ruddy pink complexion, and that pink complexion comes from hemoglobin. Another type of color that we see in skin is something called carotene or beta carotene. And as you would imagine, this has a yellow to orange coloration, just like carrots. And we tend to see carotene most concentrated in areas of the skin that have a lot of fat associated with them. And as it turns out, one of the areas of the body that has a lot of fat in the underlying tissues is in the feet. And if you look at the bottoms of the feet, particularly in Caucasians or even Asian people, you will see a yellow to orange coloration. And this is due to the presence of carotene and the underlying fatty tissues. So, your individual coloration will depend on the expression of hemoglobin uh, as well as carotene and of course the amount of melanin that's in your skin as well. Now of the three pigments, melanin is the only one that actually helps to protect our cells and our tissues from UV radiation. And as you probably already know, there is a genetic difference in the production of melanin and amount of melanin in peoples throughout the world. For example, if you look at people that live in uh, latitudes very close to the equator, they tend to be darker complected. Uh, think about your Tongans, your Samoans, Hawaiians. And in part, this is because uh, they need a greater amount of pigment to protect their tissues from the greater incidence of UV radiation. On the other hand, if you look at people that live towards the poles, and we're thinking of Sweden and places like that, where they don't have a whole lot of incident sunshine, they tend to be very light complected because we do need a certain amount of UV radiation in order to make the functional forms of vitamin D. Now, because people generally have hairless skin that's relatively unpigmented, we can actually use the color of the skin to indicate their health status. Unfortunately, most of our canine and feline patients have lots and lots and lots of hair, which makes it very difficult to use skin as an indicator. Fortunately, we can use the mucous membranes. So the mucous membranes, of course, are the membranes inside the mouth, uh, inside the eyelids, uh, and also inside the anus. They tend to be unpigmented, except in some breeds, and you can use the coloration of the mucous membranes to give yourself an indication of your patient's health status. For example, if we take a look at the image at top left, we see the normal bubblegum pink mucous membranes that we commonly see in healthy dogs and cats. On the other hand, if you look at a dog and you see a very pale mucous membrane, that usually indicates there's a problem with tissue perfusion. That animal is either anemic or it has a lower than normal blood volume or blood pressure that's causing a problem with blood getting through the tissues in a timely manner. And at the bottom left, you can see icteric. And icteric coloration is yellow. Now this yellow comes from the bilirubin that's a byproduct of liver metabolism and if the liver's not working properly we'll have a buildup of bilirubin and that'll cause the mucous membranes to become more yellow. We also call this jaundice.
And finally at the bottom right, you see a very dark bluish mucous membrane coloration, which is never a good sign. And this blueness is often caused by hypoxemia or hypoxia, that is a lack of oxygen. And so if you have a patient on the table under anesthesia and you see blue mucous membranes, it means you probably want to up the oxygen and give that patient some ventilations. And finally, another type of coloration you can see in the mucous membranes are petechiae. These are little blotchy spots inside the mucous membranes, and often they're a result of some kind of clotting disorder. For example, disseminated intervascular coagulation, or DIC, sometimes results in these splotchy spots within the mucous membranes. Okay, this table just gives you a summary of the different colorations you might see inside your patient's mucous membranes. Just remember that pink, that is bubblegum pink, is the normal coloration for mucous membranes. If you see any other coloration, such as yellow or blue or even bright red, that's an indication that something's up with that patient's health status and you should probably alert the veterinarian right away. Okay, now we're going to go talk about the five layers or strata of the epidermis. And these include the stratum corneum, the stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, and stratum basale. So the first layer of the epidermis is called the stratum basale or the stratum germinativum. Now this is a single layer of cells that is sitting on the basement membrane. Remember the basement membrane is the junction between epithelial tissue above and connective tissue below. And so this is a single layer of cells that are dividing very rapidly. And this layer is called the stratum germinativum because it gives rise to all the cells that are above the stratum basale. And so this is the cell layer where new cells are created. Now it's important to realize that when we have damage to the stratum germinativum, uh, we can have some migration of cells to fill in that area. Let's say if you get a minor cut or something like that. But if we get a very, very large cut, let's say to over an inch of the skin, it's very unlikely that those epithelial cells will be able to migrate and divide enough to fill in that gap. So in that case, if we have a widespread destruction of the stratum germinativum, we often need to get a skin graft in order to repair that skin. The next layer above the stratum germinativum is something called the stratum spinosum. And spinosum here just means spiny. And it consists of about 8 to 10 cell layers of nice living cells. Now you look at them and they don't appear to be really squamous cells, maybe a little bit cuboidal. But remember the whole epidermis is considered stratified squamous because the upper cells are squamous. So here in the spinosum we have 8 to 10 cell layers of living cells and they're held together by special cellular connections called desmosomes. Now when we preserve this tissue it creates a spiky appearance in the skin because the cells shrink a little bit which exposes their desmosomes or intracellular connections and that's why we call it the stratum spinosum. Once we fix these tissues in formalin and look at them under the microscope the cells artificially appear spiny but they aren't really spiny in living skin. So the next layer above the stratum spinosum is the stratum granulosum. And this layer contains three to five layers of flat cells that are undergoing apoptosis. And apoptosis is just a fancy way of saying programmed cell death. And so the body is programming these cells to die, and as they're dying, they're accumulating keratohyaline granules and also substantial amounts of lipid. And so when they die, they'll be pushed up to the above layers where they will form a nice flat tile-like uh, connection of cells that are very tough and very waterproof. And so again, the stratum granulosum is a transition in the skin. Everything below it is alive and everything above it is dead. And so the stratum granulosum contains three to five layers of dying cells that are accumulating keratin and also lipids. One last remark, we generally do not find the stratum granulosum nor the stratum lucidum in thin skin, that is hairy skin. We tend to only find them in thick skin, that is the skin covering the paw pads. Another layer that's only found in thick skin of the paw pads is the stratum lucidum. Lucidum here means clear and this is an aptly named layer because if you look at the stratum lucidum it appears blue or translucent uh, in coloration. And so remember the stratum lucidum contains compacted layers of dead cells and is only present in thick skin. And the final layer of the epidermis is the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is the most superficial of the strata and it consists of 25 to 30 cell layers of flat dead cells that contain a lot of keratin.
Now that we've talked about the epidermis, we're going to go on to talk about the dermis. So the dermis is the layer beneath the epidermis, and the dermis is composed of connective tissue. There are two different regions of the dermis, the upper papillary region and the lower reticular region. So let's take a look first at the papillary layer. Remember the word papillae means bump or nipple-like projection. And so here in this slide you can see the bumps that unite the papillary layer to the overlying epidermal layer. Now the papillary layer is composed of a loose fibrous connective tissue, otherwise known as areolar tissue. And so the dermal papillae have two functions. First, they have lots of blood vessels in them. And these blood vessels are very important because they are the closest nutrient source for all the epithelial tissue that's in the epidermis. The other function of the dermal papillae is they help to hold the epidermis to the dermis. If you take a look at the picture at right, you can see that there's almost a tongue and groove type of architecture going on here. And this helps to prevent shearing of the epidermis from the dermis due to friction. So the layer below the papillary layer is called the reticular layer. And the reticular dermis is composed of dense irregular fibrous connective tissue. Remember that dense irregular fibrous connective tissue has fibers that are going every which direction and they tend to be very thick fibers. And this makes skin fairly strong no matter which direction you pull it in. However, there is a order to the fibers that more of them tend to go in one direction to the other which leads to tension lines and also lines of cleavage. Another thing I should point out about the reticular region of the dermis is just like the papillary region, there are blood vessels here as well as sensory receptors. So now we're going to take a look at a photograph of a histological section through the skin and see if we can identify the different layers we've learned so far. So if you take a look at the red arrow, what layer do you think that is? Well, the correct answer here is this is the stratum corneum of the epidermis. Remember, the stratum corneum contained dead, flattened epithelial cells in about 25 or 30 different layers. Now below that, the blue arrow shows the papillary region of the dermis. Remember, the papillary region contains areolar connective tissue, which contain blood vessels and also sensory receptors as well. And finally, the green arrowhead here indicates the reticular dermis, which is composed of dense, irregular, fibrous connective tissue. And remember, this is connective tissue where the fibers were oriented in all different directions. And so the connective tissue layers, that is the papillary layer and the reticular layer, contain blood vessels and also sensory receptors, whereas the epithelial cell layer contains sensory receptors but no blood vessels. All the nutrients that supply the epithelial layer have to come from the underlying connective tissue layers. Now the third layer we're going to talk about here is the hypodermis. Remember, hypo means below and dermis here referring to the skin. And so I should remind you that the hypodermis is not technically part of the skin as defined by the authors of your textbook and indeed most anatomists. However, we are going to cover it here because it is found just underneath the skin. And so the hypodermis or subcutaneous layer is composed chiefly of adipose tissue and also areolar tissue. Just like the dermis, we have lots of blood vessels here. We also have lymphatic vessels and lots of nerves and sensory receptors. So here's another histological section through the skin showing now all three layers. We have the epidermis up top, which is made up of stratified squamous epithelium. The dermis in the middle, which is composed of areolar tissue and the papillary layer, and also dense irregular fibrous connective tissue and the reticular layer. And finally, down deep, we have the hypodermis. Remember, the hypodermis was chiefly made up of adipocytes or fat tissue and also lots of areolar connective tissue. Okay, now we're going to take a look at some special features of the integument or skin. Now, for the most part, these features are derived from the embryonic epidermis, so they're epithelial in origin. Now, these include structures such as the hair, the sweat glands and oil glands, as well as the hooves and also the paw pads. So we'll spend a few slides talking about each of these. Okay, the first special feature of the integument is hair or fur. As you probably already know, the fur is important in helping to insulate the animal and maintain body temperature. Now, fur can also help to camouflage the animal and is also important for defensive displays. For example, think about what happens when your cat is startled or challenged by another feline in the neighborhood. Its hair will stand up on end. This not only tells the other cat that, hey, I'm really pissed off, don't mess with me, but it also makes the animal look bigger so the predator or would-be challenger may think twice about attacking your cat. And of course you probably already know that hairs are produced in hair follicles. 
but what you might not know is that a follicle is a specific term that we're going to see again and again in this class. Specifically, a follicle is a sac of epithelial tissue that is secreting something. And so hair follicles are the structures that produce hair, and they start out on the epidermis, but they extend very deep into the dermis by about four to five millimeters, so they can be quite deep. And the parts of the hair include the hair root papillae, and this is where the blood vessels are located and the most active cell division is going on. Now, on the outside of that, we have a peripheral connective tissue sheath, and beneath that, an inner epithelial sheath that makes up the walls of the hair follicle. And finally, we have something called the hair matrix, which again is actively dividing cells that are giving rise to this hair. Okay, this slide just shows a histological section of hairy skin. Remember, hairy skin generally only has three epithelial layers. And what you can see here is the hair follicle, the sac that produces the hair, actually extends very deep into the skin, way down into the dermis and hypodermis. But the important point to get from this picture is that the epithelial tissue also goes down into those deeper tissue layers and surrounds the hair. And so the hair itself is produced by the follicle, which is epithelial tissue. Now we already said that hair has two main parts. There's the root or hair bulb where keratinization and cell division is going on. And then we have the hair shaft. The hair shaft is composed of completely dead keratinized cells. Now the shaft itself may have three different layers. On the outside is a single layer of cells called the cuticle. Inside of this is the cortex, which is an area that surrounds the medulla. And the medulla is the very inside layer that consists of soft keratin and spaces, and this is absent in very fine hair. It's important to realize that the hair follicles on animals are often compound follicles. That is, several hairs can emerge from a single skin pore. When this happens, the dominant hair here will be the primary or guard hairs. These are the longest hairs in the follicle and tend to be thicker and also longer. On the other hand, secondary or wool type hairs are found in animals like sheep. These hairs are generally wavy or bristled in dogs and are the predominant hair in species with wool type coats. And lastly, we have our tactile hairs. Tactile hairs are used as probes and feelers. They have a very well developed hair root plexus around them. And so when your cat brushes against something with its whiskers, even though that hair is dead, the movement of the hair in the follicle will activate the hair root plexus and send nerve impulses to that animal's brain. And it gives it a little bit of information about its surrounding environment, even though it might be pitch dark outside. Now, as we've already mentioned, the color of hair is due to the presence of pigment granules within the cortex and medullary cavities of the hair shaft. The different colors we see in different breeds result from the quantity and type of melanin incorporated in the hair. Now, it's important to realize that horses produce only one type of melanin, whereas dogs produce two. And as animals age, the melanin production decreases and hairs begin to turn gray, just like in people. Now, of course, there are some animals like polar bears that just have white hair, and this is formed when the cortex either loses its pigment or never had any pigment. In these cases, the medulla will become completely filled with air, which gives the hair its white coloration. Okay, if you already have furry family members at home, that is cats and dogs, you're probably already aware that hair growth does occur in a cycle. The first phase of this cycle is the antigen phase. This is the phase when the hair is actively growing and increasing in length. The telogen phase, on the other hand, is the period where maximum length has already been obtained and the hair is basically held in place for some time. Now, at the end of the telogen phase, that hair will be shed. And when this happens, it can be exacerbated by hormone levels. For example, if a mother uh, dog has puppies, she can blow her coat. This also happens in the veterinary clinic uh, when an animal is stressed during a physical exam. If you're examining an animal, you'll notice that all of a sudden clumps and clumps of hair start coming out due to the stress and principle because of the hormone cortisol. So this is called telogen effluvium. Now the catagen phase is just a transition between antigen and telogen. Just remember, antigen is the growth phase, telogen is the quiescent phase or quiet phase, and the phase after which the hair will be shed. Now there are a suite of accessory structures that are associated with the hair or hair follicles. And the first of these is something called the erector pili muscle. And remember that pili here means hair, and erector is something that is going to stand that hair up straight. And so the erector pili muscle is composed of smooth muscle, and it basically connects the base of the hair to the surface of the skin. 
Now the other thing associated with the hair or hair follicle is something called the hair root plexus. And the hair root plexus is basically a network of nervous tissue that surrounds the base of the hair follicle. And this is one reason why plucking hairs can be very painful. But the real purpose for the hair root plexus is to sense any vibration or movement that comes through the hairs. Now remember the hair shaft itself and all the hair parts that are exposed above the skin are dead. However, they are connected to the hair root plexus below the skin. And so let's say if an insect lands on your hair or a spider or something like that, we can actually feel that movement in our hair because it vibrates or moves our hair root plexus. Finally, another type of gland that we have on the surface of our skin is something called a sudoriferous or sweat gland. And there's two different types of sweat glands. The first of these is eccrine sweat glands, and eccrine sweat glands have a duct that empties onto the skin surface, usually not into a hair follicle. And eccrine sweat glands produce a sweat that is very watery, about 98% water, contains a little bit of dissolved ions, for example, sodium ions, chloride ions, it also contains the urea, a little bit of ammonia, but it tends to be a very watery secretion. On the other hand, apocrine or apocrine sweat glands are just found in the groin and also in the armpits. And they tend to empty directly into a hair follicle rather than emptying on the skin surface. And the secretions of apocrine sweat glands tend to be a lot thicker, uh, a lot fattier than those of eccrine sweat glands. Another accessory structure associated with hair follicles is something called a sebaceous gland. A sebaceous gland is basically an oil gland. That is, it produces an oily-like secretion which lubricates our skin surface and also gives a nice sheen to our hair. And so the sebaceous glands themselves are extensions of epithelial tissue from the epidermis that extend way down into the dermis. And most of these glands have a single duct that empties into a hair follicle. And the sebum here is composed primarily of glycerides and also fatty acids. And so the purpose here is to trap moisture, uh, keep hair soft and luxuriant, and it also helps to reduce the risk of infection in the skin. There are some antimicrobial properties about sebum. The last thing you should know about sebaceous glands is they are holocrine glands. And remember, holocrine glands are epithelial glands where the whole cell accumulates a secretion and then bursts to become part of that secretion. Now in sheep, we find these sebaceous glands located in particular within these cutaneous pouches. These pouches are special infoldings of the skin that are found in the infraorbital region, the interdigital region, that is in between the toes, and also in the inguinal region, that is towards the groin. Now these areas contain fine hairs and very numerous sebaceous glands. Just like other sebaceous glands, these glands secrete sebum, but this sebum eventually becomes something called lanolin. So lanolin is a fatty yellow substance which covers the skin and sticks to it when it's dry. And of course lanolin helps to waterproof the sheep, it helps to make the hairs very uh, soft, and so it's sort of like a conditioner in the sheep, and it's also something which is harvested and used in different udder balms and things like that. You might even find some hand creams on the market that contain significant amounts of lanolin. Another modification of the skin or integument are the paw pads. The paw pads are composed of thick skin, that is skin composed of all five epidermal layers, and underneath this skin we have a very thick adipose layer within the hypodermis. Now the skin on the outside of the paw pads has a very thick stratum corneum which makes them very good at resisting abrasion. Uh, the skin is usually pigmented and also organized in papillae or cones and we think this helps to give the animal a little bit better grip on the surfaces that it's walking on. It's also important to realize that the uh, paw pads themselves have significant numbers of sweat glands in them. And so we said even though dogs and cats don't sweat a whole lot, they do sweat a fair bit through their feet. And if you've ever had an animal that's stressed up on an exam table, particularly if that exam table is smooth on the top, uh, and take that animal down, you can see that there's actually little sweat prints uh, from where that animal was walking. Now we might see three different types of paw pads on the paws of your animals. For example, the carpal pad, shown here, covers the wrist, whereas the metacarpal pad covers the palm or metacarpals, and finally the digital pads cover the digits or phalanges. Another modification of the skin that we see in pigs, dogs, cats, and sheep is something called the planum nasale, and this is basically the skin that's covering the nose. Now just like the skin that was on the surfaces of the feet, it is pigmented, but it only here consists of three layers instead of the five that we see in the palm pads.
Another important difference between the paw pads and the plantum nasale is the plantum nasale is usually aglandular. That is, it doesn't contain sweat glands or sebaceous glands. Now in cows and horses, the plantum nasale is actually expanded into something called the plantum nasolabiale. And this is because it not only covers the nose, but also the lips. Now you might think that because a horse has hooves, it doesn't have any paw pads like a cat or a dog would. But that's not entirely true. There are vestiges of paw pads that we see on horses, and these are called arrogates and chestnuts. Now in order to understand what these structures represent, it's important for you to remember that the horse is unique and that it's walking around on its third digit, that is its middle finger. And it obviously it doesn't have any paw pads on that digit, but the arrogates and chestnuts themselves are in fact vestiges of pads from the other digits or splint bones. For example, the chestnuts are thought to be the vestiges of the carpal and tarsal pads of the first digit and the arrogates are thought to be the vestiges of the carpal and tarsal pads for the second and fourth digit. Another accessory structure of the integument or skin are the claws. And of course the claws are the very conspicuous hard outer coverings of the distal phalanges. Uh, they're made of keratin and they're usually quite pigmented, which can make it very difficult in clipping the nails and not hitting the quick. Now the claws of course function in maintaining traction and also serve as a means to defend yourself, particularly in cats. Now in cats the claws are of course retractable, whereas in dogs they aren't. Now you might see on a dog the something called a dew claw. The dew claw here is found on the inside of the leg and it's the evolutionary remnant of the first digit, that is the thumb. Now cows and pigs also have dew claws of a sort. These are found on the medial and lateral sides of the leg and are thought to be vestiges of the second and fifth digits respectively. And finally a very important albeit unpleasant accessory structure that we find in cats and dogs are the anal sacs. Uh, these are located around the anus at around five and a seven o'clock positions. They're connected to the lateral margin of the anus by a single duct and they're lined with sebaceous and apocrine glands. And these glands secrete an oily, viscous mixture that is expelled when the animal defecates. These glands produce very, very odorous secretions. And this helps the animal to mark its territory when it defecates. But another thing is these anal glands can become impacted and one of your jobs as a veterinary assistant or technician will be to express the anal glands. So how do you know when an animal has to have its anal glands expressed? Well, they're probably scratching their butt on the ground and doing what I call the boot scoot boogie. If you see a dog doing this a lot, it probably means its anal glands are stopped up and they need to be expressed in order for that animal to get relief. Now, if you've already done this, you know that expressing anal glands isn't a difficult task, but one which does require a strong constitution, and that's because they tend to be very smelly. And so what do you need? You need a pair of nitrile or latex gloves. You also need a cotton ball or some gauze. And if you're really smart, you'll coat that gauze with that nice epiotic ear cleaning solution because it smells nice and perfumey. And so what you're going to do is palpate around the anus, the perianal area, around 5 and 7 o'clock, locate the glands, see if they're swollen, and then you're going to apply some pressure on there. Now usually I actually insert one finger uh, into the anus itself and the thumbs on the outside and I gently palpate and try to squeeze in, applying gentle pressure on that anal sac. If you roll them back and forth between your fingers, you'll eventually get it to express. And if you're really good, you'll catch that expressed anal gland in the cotton, not in your face, not in your open mouth, and not in your eye. And you're going to do that again for the other side. Now once you've collected that awful smelling excreta, you're then going to take your glove off with a cotton or gauze still in your hand and envelop it in there and then tie your glove shut after you reverse it. And that way you're going to keep all that nasty smelly stuff inside your glove so that the rest of the people in the veterinary clinic don't have to smell it. Okay, before we move on to hooves and horns, I want to mention briefly a condition called dermatitis. Now dermatitis is a general name for any type of inflammation of the skin. It's often accompanied by pruritus or itchiness and also alopecia which is hair loss. Now the causes of dermatitis can be several. Uh, first of all you want to check and see if that animal has a flea infestation because that can cause dermatitis. Other things that can cause dermatitis include infestations of our mange mites, shown at bottom left, as well as fungal infections such as ringworm. 
And finally, one of the more common causes of dermatitis in dogs is allergies. In this case, we call it atopic dermatitis. And these allergies can be caused by exposure to allergens in the environment, such as grass or something like that. But oftentimes, they're often caused by food allergens. So if you have an animal that has alopecia, it has dermatitis, and it doesn't seem to have fleas or ticks or mange mites, you might want to take them to your veterinarian to see whether or not it has an allergy. Okay, now we're switching gears. And we're going to talk about horns and hooves. Hooves are horny outer coverings of the digits of some animals, and we call these animals ungulates because ungula means hoof. And the hooves themselves are epithelial in origin, whereas the underlying tissue or corium is actually modified dermis. The corium is important here because it helps to secure the hoof to the actual periosteum of the distal phalanx. And the distal phalanx of horses, of course, is called a coffin bone. And the coffin bone is connected to the hoof wall, again, via that corium material, which was dermal in origin. And the way in which that corium attaches the hoof wall is through little interdigitations called laminae. Another modification of the skin or integument are horns. Now, horns are found in several species of animals, such as cattle, uh, sheep, and goats. Uh, and horns, like hooves, are epidermal in origin. That is, they are composed of keratin, which is similar to hair. And in adults, the horn is hollow and communicates directly with the frontal sinus, that is, that hole in the frontal bone. Deep to that keratin, we have a thick tissue layer, again, called the corium. Remember, corium is a type of connective tissue. It's basically analogous to the dermis that we find in skin. There's a lot of blood vessels in there, a lot of nerves, and so forth. Now, ironically, the body of the horn is actually thinner towards the base than it is at the tips or the apex. So oftentimes, when an animal snags a horn on something, it doesn't break at the tip, but it breaks closer to the skull. Now, in some breeds, such as the Ancoli Watusi or Texas Longhorns, the horns can get ridiculously long, sometimes up to three or four feet long. Now, as you can imagine, it's pretty hard to work with cattle that have long horns like this. Not only are you worried about getting injured yourself, but you're worried about the animals injuring each other. Now, for this reason, uh, many farmers choose to breed polled breeds, that is, breeds that don't have horns, or if they do have animals with horns, they'll choose to dehorn them. And this can be done in a variety of ways. If you have a really young animal, such as a young kid goat, you can simply carterize the horn buds so the horns never grow. If you have a larger animal that already has horns, you have to use something more substantial, such as the Barnes dehorner shown at the top right of the screen. This basically works like a guillotine. You put the horn down in between the two legs of this guillotine and then quickly and violently pull them outwards to sever the horn. And of course, this can result in a little bit of bleeding and some pain for the animal, so be ready for that. So if you hang around to take Dr. Kelly's large animal class, you'll learn a lot more about the care and maintenance of animals that have horns and hooves.